Uh, what do we have on our table of treasures here? Oh, we have all sorts of Friday the 13th crap. Um, this is a walking Jason. Look at him go! Oh. Looks like he has to go to the bathroom. I know, he's doing a little... That's adorable, actually. <laughs> oh, no! And it kind of goes in a circle, too. He doesn't walk straight. Sure. Uh, but Jason does have some, some mental disabilities, so that would explain that. Aloha! Mike, this is a year of surprises. I never would have thought that you and I would sit down and have a long discussion about the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, but we did that this year. And now we're back talking about the Friday the 13th franchise, which I never, ever thought I would sit down and do a review on with you. Neither did I. <laughs> well, we won't call this a, a true review. We'll call it a cursory examination okay. of, uh, of evidentiary discussions. The, the autopsy of a long, long dead corpse. Yeah. <laughs> or just like I peeked in the window and saw something and kind of give a vague description of what I saw. Okay. Because I was drunk and, bl and blind. <laughs> That's going to be this review. It's not going to be in-depth or, or thoughtful or... We're not going to go movie by movie. No, and you're going to have more knowledge than me. I've never seen one of these movies in my life. Uh, although I think we had one on at a Halloween party once, number four. Yeah, we watched part four. It was like a VHS rip of it yeah. years ago. And I was probably half paying attention. I have very, very, very vague memories of my childhood. One being scared of the poster from the first one. Mm. These the movies silhouette. always seem so like creepy and like adult when they I was were, a kid. They, yeah, there were those movies in the video store. Yeah. Like, oh, those are the really like, yes. that's some serious shit. Right. Those are the hardcore horror movies. Right. <laughs> and it always creeped me out. And then I vaguely recall the harpoon scene from number three. Okay. Um, when he shoots the harpoon and then... I remember asking someone when I was a little kid, I, uh, why does Jason have a bag over his head? Mm. And, and I was like, well, doesn't he wear a hockey mask? And they're like, shut up. He doesn't get the hockey mask yet. Don't get you out know of the here. lore? Get out of here, kid. <laughs> okay, okay. The very complex lore that follows through movie to movie. Uh -huh. it, all, it all ties together seamlessly. Now this was like, this was like well thought out. This yeah. is like J.R.R. Tolkien. It's like it's like <laughs> drawing maps and you know languages and all that, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. There's well, a Bible, like a like a lore Friday yeah, the Thirteenth yeah. Bible. It's it's all it was all like up to him in space. It was all like very carefully thought out. Yeah, I should put out Josh and I a couple years ago. We talked about the Friday the Thirteenth movies, specifically parts four and six, because those are the two best ones in my opinion, and I think that's commonly perceived to be the two best ones in the franchise. So we talk specifically about those, but this is going to be more of a general overview. Mm. Torture Mike episode? Hey, you're the one who decided to watch them on your own. Uh, that's true. <laughs> I didn't that's force true. you to do any of this. I, I, I watched the movies. I didn't take notes while watching them. But we should point out you've only watched the first five. Yes, this is We're about doing, the first This is five. part one. We'll do the other half whenever you finish the other ones. Right. I, so I watched the first five, um, mostly one a night. I think I took a little break. But I didn't write down notes. Uh, what I did, though, Jay, and this is this, I, I did write some notes down. But you got to keep track of all the complicated lore. Uh, well, you you know it more than me. I have a couple <laughs> of uh, whatever uh, questions you got. Hit me up. I don't have questions, um, uh, but I have some some. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about the characters in the film. Uh, we have Alice. You're talking about specifically the first movie. Or just you're talking about characters throughout the first five. We have Alice, we have Marcy, we have Annie, Jack, Brenda, Barry, Claudette, Jenny, Paul, Paul, Terry, Ted, Ted, Jason, Mark, Mark, Sandra, Sandra, Jeff, Vicky, Vicky, Scott, Chris, Debbie, Fox, Fox, Chili, Chuck. Rick, Rick, Andy, Rob, Samantha, Doug, Trish, Tommy, Tommy, Pam, Vinny, Joey, Neil, Mom, Sarah, Robin, Les, Anita, Bill. Pete, 
and of course Violet. Mm. Now, which was your favorite? <laughs> This is funny because when Josh and I talked about these movies, I made a big chart that I pulled out so we could keep track of all the characters. Because especially part four, there's so many characters in that movie. And yes. All, they, they all have relatively well-defined characteristics, but I couldn't tell you the name of a single one. Is part four with the double mint twins? Yes, yes. Okay, the, okay. the sexy twins that show up. And Crispin Glover's like, I'm so horny. They're trying to fuck them. Everyone's trying to fuck them. Everyone's trying to fuck the double mint twins. Right. Yeah. God, I'm horny. That's the little charms of this movie, these movies. It's like the goofy shit like that. Uh, but I know Ginny. She's the lead of part two. Uh, one of the better protagonists in one of these movies. And I know Tommy Jarvis, of course, because he survives three movies, even though he's basically a different character in each one. Part four, he's the little Corey Feldman. Right. Part, part five, he's Other Man. Uh, you said in part four, he's other man. In part four, he's, he's oh, a oh, different he, actor. Oh, part four, oh. he's Corey Feldman. Part five, there's a little cameo by Corey Feldman that they yeah. literally shot in Corey Feldman's backyard. It's just close-ups of his face, and they, like, sprayed a hose on him. Yeah. And then they shot the rest of it with a body double because he was busy making, like, the Goonies or something something real. Well, let's... Wh which character does Kevin Bacon play? He's Jack. Jack. Oh, you remember his name. I don't know why. I think huh. it's because it was early on. Okay. Kevin Bacon, yeah, and uh, uh, Crispin Glover and Corey Feldman are the people that rose to stardom uh, in this mud heap of of, of obscurity. <laughs> this, this sand pit. This of, Hollywood sand pit. Of sleazy exploitation that was somehow produced by Paramount Pictures. <laughs> well, okay. So let's start at the beginning. The first one, uh, I really loved. Oh. And the second one. The first one was like, 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 like just simple, simple, simple joy. Well, it comes across like exactly what it is, which is the yeah. director, Sean Cunningham, saying... Uh, Halloween was really popular, let's rip it off. If I had a film called Friday the 13th, I could sell that. We're gonna take out an ad in Variety. The most terrifying film ever made. Friday the 13th. We really didn't know what we are gonna make, we just wanted to see if anybody would be interested in buying it. And it's Halloween in a summer camp, that's basically what it is. Yeah, it's uh, well it has a nice little twist at the end, I suppose, a little psycho kind of twist. Oh yeah, it's, it's basically sort of, a whodunit for most yeah, of the movie. From a modern perspective, it feels like you're watching like a parody of a early 80s, late 70s horror movie. Oh yeah, and, and, it hits all the beats. Yeah, and it's just like, and it's so corny, and it's just like, you, you could almost laugh at it, and but it's where all those tropes came from. Although you can argue that the tropes really came from Halloween, which predates this, but. Well, when, this is the one that the, this movie was so successful that that led to the glut of slasher ripoffs. Yeah. So even though this is ripping off Halloween, all the other later slasher movies were ripping off Friday the 13th. Yes. So you get like a copy of a copy of a copy. Right. Um, and, and But when people go like, uh, it's a horror movie, teenagers in the woods making love, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a lake, and they go swimming in the lake, and so there's a killer in the woods. No teenagers ever go camping. No, not till part six. There's actual like okay. kids at the camp in part six, but so far it's always counselors it's, or yeah it's just in in like buildings in gross weird ugly buildings <laughs> yes <laughs> in the woods there's a there's there's a part four the one guy rob, rob or rick or something? rod not rob, rob yeah rob, rob he's he's like the guy who's walking around with the knife and he's he sits in a tent did you did you put together because he's there to get revenge on jason because jason killed his sister yeah. do you remember which character was his sister Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's the girl in part two that is having sex with her boyfriend, and I think he's on top. And then Jason comes in with like the spear and shoves it through both of them. That was Rod's sister. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Ironically, she got killed by a rod. <laughs> so she was while on a rod. Yeah. Okay. She was impaled multiple ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, anyways, yeah. So he's in a tent, but for the most part, they're in in cabins. Yeah. Killer walks around. We see legs and stabbings, and you don't really see who the killer is. And it turns out it's, uh, was that Phyllis Diller? <laughs> who was that? But it's basically someone's mom is the killer. A sweet, sweet lady in a sweater yes. is the killer. And yes. that's, that's the part of the movie I like. The first movie, most of it is just so generic that I'm kind of like not that interested. But when she shows up, it really, she goes crazy and it's kind of fun. Killer mommy. 
kill her. Don't let her get away, Mommy. Don't let her live. I won't chase her. Oh, yeah, the, her fighting the girl. Yeah. Like, this is beating each other up and <laughs> punching each other. And it gets a little weird. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like that. But the, the earlier parts I was fine with. Like, it just seems so retro and simple. It, it does have that, because that f- it's still, it's early 80s, but it still feels like 70s. Yes. That kind of laid back, late 70s. Everyone's just hanging out. Now, if you were a flavor of ice cream, what would it be? Having big mustaches. And the camp setting, they're in the woods. There's something that's kind of like, I don't know, cozy about the whole thing. But it is just all so generic and stupid. Well, it starts off with the hitchhiker girl, and she's on her way to Camp Crystal Lake. Mm-hmm. And she stops in that little small town diner. And uh, that part feels just so, so 70s. Uh, hey, man. Just Drew, hanging man. out and hitchhiking. and Can I get catch a ride, man? <laughs> Peace and love. And where are you going? You're going to Camp Blood, ain't you? God damn it, Ralph. Get out of here. Go on, get. And that way, it is kind of representative of that transition from the 70s to the 80s, where everything was now leaving the laid-back 70s, and now we're in the the moral 80s, the uh, dangerous 80s. Yeah, where it was okay to hitchhike in the 70s, and nothing ever happened to you, but then once it hits the 80s, you just get your throat slashed by some psychopath yeah. on the side of the road. Uh, which is, uh, so the twist is, in the first one, is that there is no Jason. There's Jason's mother, uh, who is mad uh, because in the 50s her son who has a giant deformed head yes was left to drown in the lake because the counselors were off having sex yes take it away jay (laughs) were you going somewhere with that (laughs) no that's what i asked during the movie every time i watch one of these fucking movies well they're they're very and all I, of them i warned you about this i said because you watch the nightmare on Elm street movies and you're like maybe friday the 13th next and it's like you're not going to have the same reaction to those because they all get no. very samey yeah yeah five yeah. is actually a good place to break with this uh end on five and then we'll do the next five part six onward five took a little twist because it takes a little twist but at the same time it's like okay what else can you do with this very very simple formula uh six kind of breathes some new life into it by making the bold decision to actually make a good movie it feels like a real movie so what were you going to be when you grew up so it kind of breathes breathes some more life into the franchise and then you have that continuing diminishing returns But the twist, you get to part two, and the twist is, oh, uh, it completely invalidates everything that Mrs. Voorhees was doing in part one, because, oh, Jason's just alive. He must have seen the whole thing happen. He must have seen his mother get killed, and all just because she loved him. He didn't drown. He's just been living in a dirty shack in the woods. Well, okay, like, when they, when they, obviously she thought he drowned? Yeah. Uh, And so, I, I know this is pointless to even bring this up. This is when you get to part two, you say, oh, we killed off the killer in the first movie. What do we do? Oh, Jason's alive. Yeah. They offer me part two, and then I got the script, and Jason is running around. I thought, what are you doing? Uh, Obviously, it was a retroactive. They didn't really think about this, and they thought, wow, like an actual killer, adult male is better Mm -hmm. than Phyllis Diller. (laughs) Um, You have a nice little twist with the first one, but... Yeah, it works, like we always say with like Halloween, like it works as its own movie. Where it's like, that's your twist, it's the little old lady, sweet old lady. So did they pull Jason's lifeless body, waterlogged body, out of the lake, attempt resuscitation and fail, mm-hmm. then go through the process of having a funeral and burying him and all that? Well, I believe or was he just never found? I think they say he was never found. His body was never recovered from the lake after he drowned. Okay. If not in part two, then in one of them. But I think it's part two because they have that nice little campfire scene. Part two is like uh, growing on me as being one of the best. I, I really liked, liked part two. I've always liked part four. Part two is really good too. It's got a good protagonist with Ginny. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has the most like what this kind of whole franchise really is, which is just like a campfire tale. So you have that scene with all the counselors sitting around the campfire and they're telling the background of Jason and 
He was never found. Some say he's still out there. Okay. Yeah, they it has the to... most kind of like spooky campfire tale vibe to it. Okay, okay. So, okay, say, say oh, he drowned. We're assuming he drowned. Mm-hmm. We don't really know. And he is, I don't know, is he just deformed or mentally, he's mentally slow, right? I, I think he would have to be, yeah. Okay, so if he was mentally slow and he got lost in the water and washed ashore on the other side of the lake or got confused and then just ended up living in the woods <laughs> until he became- <laughs> 30 years. With eating, eating roadkill and plants, surviving on, on he, they, some, somebody says that, a police officer or something, surviving on roadkill and, and foliage or something. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. That's relatively conceivable. He couldn't find his way back to his house to tell his mom, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she didn't, even though he was never found, she never thought to go looking around the one square mile area around the lake. (laughs) Just literally walk around the lake. And maybe run into him because he's within walking distance. So, or uh, perhaps searchers, Mm -hmm. the local community gathers together and just tries to find the missing boy, as as they often do in real life. A boy is missing in the woods. They assume he drowned in maybe, well, it's a lake, not a river. Yeah. He got washed out to sea, no. 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 Uh, Although the lake does connect to New York City somehow, we discover when you get to Jason Takes Manhattan, because they take a boat from Camp Crystal Lake to New York City. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a campfire tale. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I always ask this question: What's what's the what are you supposed to get out of this? What's the beat? Uh, when Tom Savini is on the crew, you get good gore effects. <laughs> when he's not, you get. A close-up of a knife going in, and then, or someone going, and yeah. then cut scene. Uh, you want good kills and good gore yeah. because there is no plot. Right. It's 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 almost shocking <laughs> how little plot there is. You compare these to like the Freddy movies are like. Artwork. Well, those cinema. those are like special effects showcases, director showcases. Um, Because they're always so well directed, they're visual, they're stylish, and they have inventive, creative effects, not just kills. Oh, sure. The kills are usually the least interesting part. Like, I think of, like, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, you have Kincaid running around the junkyard, and the camera pulls out, it's a a whole world of of junked cars. Because of the... And then Jason, or then Freddy just stabs him, and then it's the end of it. Yeah. But it's the lead up. Because of the dream element, and there's always ironic deaths. Yeah. Based on the characters, like, uh, phobias or whatever. So there, the, and then you have the dream elements where you can do creative things. You yeah. can't do creative things in the woods. There's a limit of what you can do in reality. You use different tools throughout the series. He starts to get different, uh, different weapons. But no, the the appeal. It's I guess you'd say it's a guilty pleasure. It's that it is the exact opposite of the Freddy movies, where it's just blunt stupidity. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm okay with blunt <laughs> stupidity, as, uh, but you have to have some investment because I'm watching these and like the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie, uh, the sequels aside, because the first one's like most sequels, the first one's an encapsulated great idea. Yeah. And it's like you have these high school students and they're being, first they're being stalked and tormented in their dreams by a mysterious man, knives on his fingers. Then they figure out that he has a, a past they figure out who he is, and then they come up with a plan of action mm-hmm. to stop him. Yes. In the, the Friday the 13th movies, a bunch of people go to some place, and then they wander around. Everybody hangs out until they get killed. And then they just get killed off one at a time until the very end, when it's one girl running around being chased until they stop Jason somehow. Mm-hmm. And there's no like communication. There's no like, the only thing that even remotely comes close to anything in a plan is when Corey Feldman was like reading the newspapers and he's like, Jason was a bald headed, deformed boy who drowned in a lake. Yeah. Well, well, I'm gonna shave my head and try to trigger his, his trauma center and distract him for a moment. But, but even that is taken directly from part two, because the, and I think that's what elevates part two is the Ginny character. Oh, the mother, yeah. She's like she a, like a psychology student or something. Yes. So you have that great scene at the bar, everybody goes into town, 
and half of our characters just stay at town and they're never seen again. Right. We spent half the movie establishing all these characters and they just vanish from the movie. We actually, there, there's some uh, diversity in the second one. Yeah. There's yeah. an Asian woman and a black guy. And, and then, a kid in a wheelchair. And a guy in a wheelchair. Yeah. This is the very first diverse movie in cinema <laughs> history. And, and with the exception of the wheelchair guy who has an amazing death. Yes. Uh, the uh, the two other characters go are the ones that go into town and they don't get killed. Yeah, but in that scene in town, Ginny's using her kind of knowledge of, of psychology and talking about the psychology of Jason and like what it must have been like for him to live out in the woods and how scared he must have been. And, and he must be out there right now crying for a return, for resurrection. I think you're drunk. <laughs> then she uses psychology against him at the end when she sees the severed head of his mom in the shack and puts on her sweatshirt and tricks him. That's right. It's basically the same thing Corey Feldman does yeah, in part yeah. four. Because Jason in his shack in the woods has a shrine to his mother, mm -hmm. her dirty, her dirty giant sweater <laughs> and her uh, head, Yeah. her rotting head. So yes, I, and I liked, I liked that he had that shrine because it shows he has uh, mother issues. He's and a mama's he's, boy. And he's completely fucking insane. Yes. And yes. not even human, just <laughs> fucking bad shit. Uh, but that, I mean, that's really the limit of his character. Yeah. And it's different than Michael Myers. You can argue the same thing with Michael Myers, is that he's just like a faceless, boring killer. But the, the best movies in the franchise have, yeah, at the very least, like a protagonist that you kind of like watching. Right. Uh, Ginny in part two. I like the family in part four a lot. Corey yeah. Feldman and his sister and the mom. Like, that's a new angle for it. Uh, and that's why I remember you, t you messaged me after three, and you're like, it's so bad. Three's a low point. That's where it's like, okay, we're done. Yeah. We're completely out of ideas. 3D? No. I'm warning you, Andy. I'll break your string. You know I work very hard around here trying to keep up with you and I. I, I hate it. <laughs> three so much because, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like, uh, peaks and valleys like uh, of this series where it's just like it, they run it into the ground and they restart it and they run it into the ground and then three is like the low point first one solid fine second one was really good second one i think was one of the highest most successful horror films like budget wise oh okay so it cost like Fifteen dollars to make. Well, that, that's why they kept making these, even though Paramount oh, was like that. horribly yeah. embarrassed of them. Is yeah. that they just made so much money? Sure, just crank them out every year until they stop making money. All right, and, and then you sell it to New Line Cinema. Yeah, and <laughs> they, they just didn't become. I get it. They they didn't want to become like just bogged down in this complicated plot. They're just like fuck it. You well, know. that's why Part Four was supposed to be the final one. It's called the final chapter, but yeah. then it just made so much money. And then you're like, well, we killed Jason. What do we do? Well, we'll talk about five in a minute. But three, because I want to talk about three. Oh, the third one is when it just magically becomes California. Yeah. From New Jersey. It's Yeah, those first two movies. I think that's another charm of those first two is that, that East Coast atmosphere, the vibe of those type of characters. They're all very, like, New York, New Jersey. Uh-huh. Uh, and then, yeah, the third one, they move production to California, and it just has a different feel to it. Right. It doesn't feel like a, like a camp. Like yeah. A, I know they probably have summer camps and stuff in California, but the woods aren't quite so dark and, and uh, green. It's a little more like, you know, those, like, kind of light-colored... California trees that are and the, the shrubbery and you see the little rolling hills in the background yeah. sunny and it just has a totally different vibe it's not a spooky dark uh, misty camp in in the east coast right just wrong <laughs> all around wrong but so yeah they all show up and Dan Bill, <laughs> some guy's in charge of all the camp counselors. Okay, kids, and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, blah, that's blah. part two. There's no counselors in part three. Part three is just that oh. group of friends that go to the oh, cabin shit. in the woods. <sighs> Fuck. Yeah. This is what happens. Oh, yeah, they rent a cabin. Yeah. And uh, that's with the barn, that fucking barn. 
Everybody's attracted to that barn. It's like a magnet for bikers for some reason. Oh, three is when he gets his hockey mask. That's the, the fat guy with the curly hair yeah. who's like... Who's Shelly. I remember his Shelley. name. Yes, he's doing pranks. Um, the, the worst character. Would you be yourself if you look like this? X, oh, 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 they go to a convenience store. Yeah. And uh, for no reason, there's like like really tough biker characters there. That's how you know it's still in New Jersey, because I think there's a sign in that convenience store that says New Jersey. You're like, I'm not buying this. Uh, oh, so, so Shelly backs into the bikers, but motorcycles and knocks them over, and then, then that leads them to come to the, the house. They follow them there. The bikers have a plan. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. They just kind of hang out in the barn. Now they have a revenge plan, and the oh. revenge plan is go up to their van and siphon the gasoline out of the van, which I thought, oh, but it does pay off later because it, it runs out of gas. It has very little gas left in it. Sure. And then they get stuck on that bridge, and then the van falls off the bridge into the river. But they siphon off the gas in the van, and they decide to set the barn on fire. Not the house, but the barn. Mm -hmm. Even though they don't know whose house this is, uh, I guess they're just wild bikers, and they're just. But revenge is like uh, slash their tires. Yeah. Or like beat them up, or and to set the barn on fire. It's so weird. So then you, they go. You gotta have a flimsy reason for them to hang around, so they could eventually get killed by Jason. Sure. But how about like hang, go in the barn and like peek out the window, and be like, wait, let's wait for him to come out. Yeah. And then we'll fucking jump him and just beat his skull in. Sure. That's what bikers would do. But anyways, they go in the barn, and it's like the first time they've ever seen objects <laughs> on planet earth remember the girl the girl bikers walk around she's like ooh. she's like touching everything yeah. well she swings up there's like a tire swing Woo! this feels good yeah and she's like this feels good yeah it's like this feels good what, you've never been on a swing before well there, there's a, like a tracking shot where she's walking through the barn and she's just like fascinated with every object in yeah. the barn it's just like do something <laughs> do something to kill time that, that's killing time is a big part of these early movies, too, because the, uh, the opening of part two, where they bring back Alice uh, from the first movie, the, the final girl from the first movie. Yes. We, we watch her hanging around in her apartment oh, for like God. 10 minutes, and apparently none of that was scripted. They're just like, we're going to get Alice, what's her name? Adrian King is the actress. They're like, we're going to bring you back for the second movie. We don't have anything written. Just improvise. And so she like calls her mom and she's like, I got to move on with my life, ma. She's just like making shit up. I just have to put my life back together and this is the only way I know how. So they could stretch the runtime yeah. before she just gets killed anyway. Yeah. Well, and the <laughs> second and third movies and I don't know about the fourth, but they have extensive recaps from the previous film. Yeah. Well, I, I think at the time that these were coming out, VHS wasn't as big. If you didn't, you probably saw the last movie in the theater and that was it. So a year, two years later, you're going to need an extensive recap because you're not going to remember any of this shit. Sure. They yeah. did that with like the Star Wars movies too. Like remember in Empire Strikes Back at the beginning? They just like... Luke, it's like Luke 15 looks, minutes of Luke, clips. Luke is sitting there on the hoth <laughs> and he's like... <laughs> and then it shows all the events from Star Wars for like 15 minutes. I, I know. That's crazy. I know this doesn't need to be said, but Friday the 13th is no Star Wars. Uh, yeah. Because Jason just now kills anyone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Motivation's out the window now. No motivation. We just have to keep the franchise going. And just, uh, and I believe the second one has some good kills. I can't remember. Well, the second one is the wheelchair kid, which is good. Yeah. That's the best one. That's the only one that really stands out. There's the, the couple that gets impaled, which is directly stolen from a Mario Bava movie, like shot for shot. Those are the best ones. Crazy Ralph gets killed. That's a non-Tom Savini one? Yeah, Tom Savini did the first one, and then he came back for the fourth one. Okay. Because they told him it was going to be the last. So he's like, oh... I'll kill off my creation. I'll kill off Jason because this is the last one they're ever going to make. The effects in four are quality. J Jason gets the machete to his face, falls uh, yes, down, that's the most slowly slides off the top Cuts of his, his head. head part, yeah. Crispin Glover with the, uh, the corkscrew. Ted, hey, Ted, where the hell's the corkscrew? Yeah. There's good stuff in the fourth one, but the third one, it has the guy whose eyeball gets shot out in 3D. And you see it stop. It's like they edited it wrong because it's supposed to keep flying, but it flies out and they clearly edit it on like a stick. And they just went, eh, 
Yeah, I hate the third one. I don't. I think I hate the fifth one more. Okay. Uh, A lot of people hate the fifth one. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the third one at least had the, uh, I don't know, the idea of a bunch of young people going to a cabin and getting killed off. The fifth one, was this a rehab or, uh, I don't know. No, but it's, oh, okay. So it's like mentally ill kids. Because mm -hmm. our hero is grown up Corey Feldman. Uh, Tommy Jarvis. Tommy Jarvis. And uh, he is crazy because of his experiences when he <laughs> Corey Feldman hacked Jason to death. Die, die, die. <laughs> Uh, but then they established that the, this is a place for wayward, troubled youths, uh, and the guy who runs it is like a, I don't know, I guess you could call him like a hippie, mm -hmm. uh, for the lack of a better term. He's just like, hey, we go in the honor system here, man. You do your thing, and then I'll stay out of your hair. We always see what happens when you're that laid back. <laughs> You have the psychopath biker kid hacks some fat kid up with an axe. Yes, yes. The the, the, the the fat kid who has chocolate all over his mouth and candy bars in every pocket. <laughs> and anyway, uh, I got two chocolate bars, see? Don't tell the girls. This is why I like the fifth one. It's so stupid. It's, it's, it's like it surpasses stupid and becomes art. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. And then uh, Cousin Eddie and his mother, who's an actress who's the same age as him, but she's wearing a wig. She's wearing like a curly haired wig. It's like obnoxious, like bad comedy. All their, all their dialogue is like uh, so vulgar. Would you shut the fuck up? You big dildo. Eat your fucking slot. Who the fuck are you? What the fuck do you want? Are you hearing me, boss? Get off this fucking and the, but what's like they established that she shows up and she's like you better this 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 ha house or compound or whatever it is with with crazy teenagers it's up to no good and I don't want it in my community. Mm -hmm. Well, and then they just die. Well, that's her character. You got to make it. You got to make the audience dislike her. So when she dies, it's satisfying, I guess. Uh, yeah, but you establish a little plot point and you don't like. <laughs> There's no consequence to bringing that up. There's she, no... she doesn't do anything to try and like bring down the group home or no. talk to the authority. I think she does talk to the cops, but that's about it. But it's it doesn't like, go anywhere. You have to like. There has to be reverberations for bringing something up. Like mm -hmm. at some point, like I mean, now it's not a long-term storyline. It's supposed to take place over a day or so, and they right. all get murdered. But like, I don't know. Do something with bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, it's so bad. Oh, God. You big dildo. Eat your fucking slop. W would you be shocked to learn the director of part five previous to this did pornos? I would not be shocked. In the background, off screen, is Danny Steinman, the director, yelling, come on, fuck her, fuck her, fuck her harder. Come on, come on, grab her, grab her. Maybe that's where his like comedy sense comes from too. Just not caring. I, I think it's yeah, because like everybody's like in a different movie in it. It does. It's not cohesive at all. Again, that's kind of what I think is funny about it. But it, it's, I mean, it's it's there, so ridiculous and goofy and like tonally everything's wrong. I had a big laugh when uh, I forget what character is like harassing Tommy. It's like they're having breakfast, and they're like, "Go get." Uh, I don't know, Ricky or Johnny, bring him down to breakfast, Tommy. And he's like, okay. And then he shows up in the door and he's like, what's up, idiot? And he's poking oh, him. Oh, yeah. And this then Tommy <laughs> picks him up and just like body slams him on the sink. And I was like, whoa. He starts breaking furniture. And I was just like, that was hilarious. What, what was that? What's going on? What is this? What movie is this? Or the fact that our final girl, who's barely even like an established character through the movie, that blonde lady, they're running around in the rain at the end of the movie, and she's just in like a see-through white shirt oh, right. for the entire climax yeah, yes. of the film. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then there's the little black kid whose grandfather is the chef. Yes. Uh, whose older brother lives in a trailer. Oh my God! What well, get your ass in here, boy? That's where you get the famous those damn enchiladas. Oh yes. That's some the, more of the comedy. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Hey, you okay? Oh. 
some damn enchiladas. Oh. Uh, he goes, yes, he lives in a van. Oh, it's a van, yeah. It's, a, it's like a van, and he's dressed like Michael Jackson. We have <laughs> Michael Jackson and we have uh, Madonna yes. in this movie. Yes. Um, and him and his girlfriend live in a van outside of a trailer park mm-hmm. in like the, a filthy redneck, muddy redneck community. He's dressed <laughs> like, he's fully decked out. Yeah. On a, just a regular leather, Tuesday night. Leather head to toe. But yeah, yeah. He's got his well, hair Well, you got to get done. dressed up when you're eating those damn enchiladas. Some damn enchiladas! And while he's trying to take a shit, his girlfriend's outside just, like, talking to him. Oh, lighten up, demon. You'll feel a lot better after you shit. <laughs> no, they start singing. And then they start the singing at each bizarre, other. <laughs> bizarre scene I've ever, ever seen in a feature film. Ooh, baby. Hey, baby. Ooh, baby. It's like they said, what are we supposed to sing? Yeah. I don't know. We don't have the, the clearance to sing anything. We don't. We didn't get any rights to any. Don't sing the fucking song. We don't know. have the budget to put an, a single song in this film. Uh, yeah. Ooh. No, you can't sing a Michael cut Jackson cut it, cut it. song because we don't have the rights. Well, what are we supposed to sing? Just say, oh, baby, baby. Or something. <laughs> ooh, baby, baby. It's like, what, is that the song? Is, did they make that song up? And why is she singing it to him while he's taking a dump? Yeah. Like taking yeah. a poop. <laughs> ooh, baby, 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 ooh, baby. Lighten up, demon. You'll feel a lot better after you shit. <laughs> Ooh, baby. There are numerous scenes in these films of people going to take craps. Well, if you're you're uh, camping, I mean that's a big thing you got to keep track of. But Where they, am I gonna shit? Well, yeah. Well, the one, the two greaser guys. One guy goes off to the woods to poop. There's because we have '50s greasers in this. Yeah, movie we don't too. see him poop or anything. He just comes back. He was just an excuse to make him leave so that his friend brother. Twin yeah. could die, but then- well, this, this is some more of the movie's great dialogue, where the one says, I'm going to take a crap, and the other guy says, crap my ass. <laughs> right, right. I gotta take a crap. Crap my ass. But that, yeah, when he's waiting for his brother, friend, lover, lover, uh, something to come back, he's like, he's like on like, Five pounds of cocaine. He's like, it's like, oh god, boo shop. Come on, motherfucker. Fix the fucking car. Fucked up again, you asshole. I'm like, what is he doing? Yeah, yeah. Who's in charge? on cocaine in this movie because you got the guy at the meet his girlfriend at the diner. She's getting off work. Yeah. He's snorting coke, mustache yes. man. Every, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is everyone just gets up from taking nasty shits without wiping. <laughs> Again, you're in the woods. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, but and and you're the the Michael Jackson guy felt like he was in danger. He's something was wrong. So yeah, he got got up and uh, I could I could understand not wiping if you feel like there's a killer outside. Yeah, I feel like it's more dangerous though when you're wearing leather pants. Like everything's just gonna start sliding around. Yeah. Especially after bad enchiladas. Those damn enchiladas. Just some damn enchiladas. There's a, there's a really great scene. Uh, and it's so weird, and it's so badly directed and staged, and and the purpose of it is uh, that the 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 kid, what's his name? I don't know. Tommy Jarvis? No, the little black kid. Oh, Reggie. Reggie is running around, and Jason has gone through the house uh, and killed all the teens, love making teens, and then Jason has displayed their bodies in a bedroom. Because Reg- they saw Halloween. Yeah, Reggie goes into the room and sees all the bodies. He screams. 
What is it, Reggie? It's Pam. What's the matter? Comes out of the room and says, Trish, Kathy, <laughs> Susie, Susie, uh, whatever. Blonde lady. Yeah. Final girl uh, comes up. What's going on? Go in the room. Someone's bedroom. Whoever's bedroom it was. Okay. Walks, walks, walks. Enters the room. Mm -hmm. He waits. What do you see? This isn't a movie where she comes out and goes, I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in it. Ah, he comes up behind her. She goes in. We wait. Then she screams. Comes out. I saw exactly what you did. <laughs> <laughs> then they go on. <laughs> well, why? 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 Couldn't they have discovered that together? There was no ever set up that he uh, he tells lies, that no one believes him. Like Oh, that would be something. Yeah, that would be like, a character. Just... Just That's what I say. Everything is so bizarre and makes it's, no sense. It's very bizarre. Yeah. Uh, frustratingly so. Not uh, to the point of cinematic genius. Oh, like I, I, the think hell it would be, I think it's hilarious. You big dildo. Eat your fucking slot. So we get to the end of the fifth movie. This yeah. is uh, uh, one of the many reasons people hate this film is that it turns out that the killer is not even Jason because he died in the last movie. And they said, how do we make another movie? Copycat killer. And it's Roy, who you completely forgot about from the beginning of the film. The ambulance driver. The ambulance drive. driver, because that fat kid with chocolate all over his face was his son. They, they set that up? They do, it, yeah. He gives kind of a weird look to the camera at one point. And, and the camp counselor guy goes, that, that uh, the mentally disabled boy, his mother died during childbirth and no one ever knew who his father was. Mm. So he bounced around from foster home to foster home. So. Yeah. Until he got hacked up by a psychopath on coke. That, that, might that guy been. is so over the top too. It's, it's funnier, like, especially in contrast to the movie right before it. Because part four, everybody feels, aside from Crispin Glover, who's being Crispin Glover, mm -hmm. he still feels relatively normal in that movie. But everybody feels so like natural, like, because you have the, the family house right next to the, the house of party and teens. Mm -hmm. And they all feel like relatively realistic and grounded. Yeah. Um, the, and that, that's what kind of helps that movie is that you kind of like everybody. Yeah. I, like, I like that little family dynamic. And then, yeah, and then you get to the fifth movie and everybody's like a raging psychopath. It's so And everybody's weird. on coke. <laughs> and their performances are so over the top. The fourth one is, is nice. It's, it's, uh, they're all awkward. Like that party they have where they, keep, they switch the record player. Would you care to dance? Don't think you got this Good. Famous dance scene, of course. Well, yeah. when Crispin Glover dances, it's bizarre. But when you're, they're slow dancing and they're just trying to, the two guys are trying to court the double mint twins and trying to figure out who's, it's strange and awkward and Crispin Glover is just weird. Yeah. He's just odd. Mm -hmm. His perf it, it, it's almost like, like, especially that early scene in the car where they're in the back seat and oh, he's yeah. talking. And he calls him a dead fuck. Yeah. He says you're a dead fuck. What? A dead fuck? I did not say it. The computer did. Yeah, well, there is no computer. Uh -huh. And I don't know if it's just like self-awareness, like Crispin Glover. Like, I know he wasn't famous, and it was probably an early role for him, but but he's always been weird. He's just like, I'm just gonna be myself. Yeah. And the other guy's just like actor man, and Crispin Glover just has that something. Yeah. That makes him just odd. Yeah, that's the, Josh and I talked about that when we talked about Part Four. Is that even if Crispin Glover didn't go on to do anything else? People would still be talking about him from Friday the 13th 4. Like, who is that guy? Right. <laughs> Come on in! Oh, no. No, we, we have no suits. But him, he's like stoned out of his mind. Mm -hmm. And he does a damn good job of portraying stoned out of your mind without being obnoxious. Sure. Or, or cliched. He's just like laughing at this like weird old porno. <laughs> Uh, it, and it, it's really kind of funny, and then, you know, I guess you would call it an ironic death because he gets stabbed through the screen, sort of. Sort of. It's just sort of creative. Yeah. It's better than a corkscrew in the eye. Yeah. Where's that damn corkscrew? Oh, well, like, Crispin Gulliver gets a corkscrew in the hand. Ted! Hey, Ted, where the hell's a corkscrew? <laughs> oh, and yes. And when he turns around, he gets the machete in the That's face. That's right, yes, right, right. He gets right. it doubly bad, and then he gets uh, crucified. Oh, right. Uh -huh. So later, Jason can just knock him down. 
So it blocks he's in the way. It blocks the exit. Yeah, blocks the exit. The, the, the he's the rips through his hand. <laughs> she doesn't go out. She throws herself through the window oh, yeah. instead of going around his body. Mm-hmm. Lots, lots of jumping out of windows in part four. Lots of window breaking. And Jason loves to throw bodies through windows. Yes, uh, yes. And he loves to obliterate doors. <laughs> There's that. There, I think it's part four when uh, the lady and um, his older sister and Corey Feldman come back in the house. And yeah. They close the front door. Oh yeah. And it's like it's like a bathroom door, like a like a hollow uh, plywood. It's supposed to be the front door, door to the yeah. house. And it's yeah. got the little like little cheap lock on it. It Doesn't even have a deadbolt. Yeah. He does that again in part five in the climax too. I think it's after that scene where one yeah. by one they go look in the room. Right. <laughs> doesn't make sense the the jason from parts one through four is this um, giant hulking supernatural ish well not really supernatural yet not yet but but he's uh, but the the ambulance driver is he's just a guy is not one who could lift up a full grown male and (laughs) hurl them through a window not many people could do that yeah even like super super strong wrestler guys you pick up someone and maybe slam them down on the ground, mm-hmm. but to throw them like thirty feet through the air, like don't underestimate Roy, the ambulance driver. His son got killed, Mike. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. He's filled with rage. He's just working off of nerves. He just, nerves. Uh, he's, he's so mad about his son being killed at the camp. He went to a nearby. Uh, trailer park and killed a Michael Jackson impersonator in I uh, killed a Michael Jackson lookalike mm. in a in a uh, an outhouse yeah and his girlfriend for no reason for no reason you big dildo eat your fucking slot but you got up that body count just throw in random side that guy the that goes to pick up his girlfriend at the diner who are, who, who are those people He's doing coke in the car, yeah. and then Jason just kills him. That scene, Fake Jason just kills him for no reason. Those characters are introduced and killed in the same scene. <laughs> same with the bikers, the, the 50s you greasers. Know, you know why they had that scene, Jay? Because hmm. that lady would show her boobs. That's true. That's she true. said, I'm going to take off my shirt and change in the dirty bathroom at this <laughs> diner, and I will show my full boobs in the mirror. Yeah, and for then, no reason, to nobody. She's just like looking in the mirror. It's like uh, Monique Gabrielle in Evil Tunes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually more motivated because she's concerned about her physical appearance. That's in that right. Movie. There's that's this really smart pl- plot. Yeah, yeah. Evil, evil tunes is more thought out than Friday the Thirteenth Five. <laughs> oh yeah, and then at first I thought it was her dad picking her up. <laughs> so, he's like this old greasy. He's got a big bald, bald spot. Yeah. Oh, he's like almost completely bald. He's yeah. got a mustache, and he's like, "Come on!" And then she's like, "Okay, hold on!" And I'm like, "Oh, her dad's picking her up." Mm-hmm. I, let's go out and fuck. I got cocaine. Okay, Peppy. <laughs> what, what? What? What's their relationship? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're they're established and killed in the same scene. They for, have no connection to anyone. Yeah. Why is Roy the ambulance driver who wants revenge, killing these random people? All the deaths in the first movie make sense, right? Because it's all just the counselors, and it's Pamela Voorhees is out for revenge because. She's, her brain snapped because counselors killed her kid. Can I ask you a question? I was looking through the cast, and in the fourth or fifth movie, there's an actress who's just in one of the movies. Okay. Her last name is Voorhees. Oh, yeah. She's the one that gets the shears in the eyes. <laughs> Did they just cast her because her name was Voorhees? And they were just <laughs> like, hey, that's pretty fucking cool. You're in the movie. I don't know. You know the answer? Because I got so, like, my brain just, like, you know when you look at something and you're just like, what? And I saw Voorhees, a- a her name, and then I was like, what? is that Jason's sister in the movie? What? And then, <laughs> it, then I was like, wait a minute, the character names below the actor name. And then I got so, like, fuck her, fuck her, fuck her harder. Grab her, th- grab her. Th- She's still around. There was a song. Do you know the comedian John LaJoy? Comedian does music too. He does like comedy rap stuff, but he wrote a song uh, about that scene, her nude scene where her and her boyfriend, and then they get killed about what it, the experience of watching that as a little kid and the, the weird like mix of emotions you have as a tiny kid watching something that like we were talking about at the beginning. These are movies that are like, is this a couple that bit. goes out in the woods or they lay a blanket down? Yeah. Okay. And that's then Jason the shoves the shears girl? in her eyes. Yeah. She's okay. Voorhees. 
Uh, so John LeJoy wrote a whole song about going over to his friend's house and seeing that scene and as a little kid being like confused by it. Cause it's like, oh, pretty girl. Oh, she just got violently murdered. And then driving home on your little bike feeling uncomfortable. Mm. It's a good song. <laughs> I, I was saying before, these movies have like just all the different components. They got nudity, um, you got uh, kills. There's, um, I, I don't know if this is the earliest recorded history of the jump scare. <laughs> and the fake out. Yeah. The, the, the first three are just like clones of each other. Oh, yeah. You start with... Lots of scenes of people walking around looking for their friends. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it starts off people arriving in a car, in a van. They're going to... They never start at Camp Crystal Lake. They just, someone goes there. Right. There's a hitchhiker that gets killed. The, they have the, the first meeting. Then they all go swimming. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there's. And they all branch off and have sex. Then, or they, do then whatever. they branch off eventually. But then there's there's the fake out uh, with a monster mask. What's his face does it? Shelly does it. Oh yeah. The campfire scene in number two, I think. Yeah, the gar- awkward the ugly geeky guy. guy. The, yeah. <laughs> the one of the ones who vanishes from the movie. The caricature artist's dream come true. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to get a caricature drawn. Well, golly, mister, I can sure help you. (laughs) Sit right down. This is what I've been training for my whole life. (laughs) Sorry, that's incredibly mean, Mm. but true. It's very true, yeah. Nudity, jump scares, fake outs. Fake outs are fine. Because there's always an early fake out when the boyfriend scares her in the woods or oh, wherever. Yeah. It's like the hand comes up. Oh, it's just the boyfriend. And so you know it's not going to be Jason the first 10 minutes of the movie. Right. So you got the you know, nudity, fake outs, jump scares, uh, and uh, uh, gore. Yes. I don't know what the fifth one is. I think there's a fifth one, but gore. <laughs> gore is important. Yes, yes. Or creative kills. Gore slash creative kills. Which that goes into leading into the 80s conservatism that we were talking about as the franchise went on. You haven't really gotten to this point where they start just getting hacked to shit by the MPAA. So it's like, that's the whole reason these movies exist. Part 7 is the worst example of that. Where it's like every time, because that was directed by a special effects guy. So you know he had like really great kills planned out. Every single one of them is just pulled out of the movie. So you get the setup and then you don't get the payoff to it. But you talked about uh, rights. The, the game, there are, uh, it's a complex legal entanglement of who owns the rights to Friday the 13th, Jason, and the name Camp Crystal Lake. Yes. Well, and adult Jason versus young mongoloid Jason. Okay. Adult Jason with the hockey mask is different legal rights than the rights to the script to the first movie, because that first movie just had young Jason. It was a big, complicated lawsuit that went on for, like, years, four, five, six years, that I think has been straightened out now. I think they've finally come to an agreement. It was mainly between Sean Cunningham, who owns the rights to the series, and Victor Miller, who wrote the first movie. So I think it's all, all straightened out now, because they're making a... Well, I don't know where it is with the writer strike happening, but... It's funny because we talked about with Nightmare on Elm Street, you talked about the Springwood TV series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What t- tell me more. They're doing a uh, TV series called Crystal Lake, which may or may not have Jason in it. I don't know, but it's Brian Fuller who did like the Hannibal TV show yeah. and A24 are doing the TV series, which to me is like, I don't know, that, that Hannibal show is like kind of classy and it was pretty well received critically. And A24 is, of course, the mark of of high quality horror productions. It's all classy stuff. It's like the exact opposite of what Friday the 13th is known for, which is like cheap junk. Yeah. So I don't know what they're gonna do with it. But that brings me to my next topic. Oh. Is, is, um, is my, I have pitches and I wanted to <laughs> brainstorm with you for a bit. Okay. Because that's when I got bored scrubbing <laughs> through the movies and I'm watching I'm watching the first one, and I was trying to figure out the character's name of uh, the Harbinger guy. It's got a death curse. Oh, Crazy Ralph. Ralph. Yeah. And 
the the guy who's giving the girl a lift in his truck, the the hitchhiker girl, she yeah. goes into the, the cafe and she's like, can someone give me a ride to Camp Crystal Lake? Yeah. Um, he calls Ralph the prophet of doom. He's a real prophet of doom, ain't he? Oh. And I thought, what's Ralph's story? <laughs> this is like Star Wars territory, right? <laughs> you gotta get the Ralph prequel. Yes. Why, why is, is he like that? Why is Ralph like that? Yeah. I told the others. They didn't believe me. You're all doomed. And so... It's got a death curse on it. Exactly. I thought yeah. Ralph, a, a, a show called Prophet of Doom, the backstory of Ralph. There you go. There you um, go. And, and, and also, I was thinking, like, they, she walks in there and she's like, where's Camp Crystal Lake? And they're like, everyone, like, you hear a pin drop. And they're all like... And it's like, okay, uh, kids got murdered there 30 years ago, right? Yeah. And in all subsequent films... 15 people get murdered and then two years a year later everyone comes back and yeah. there's no like mention of it well i think parts two three and four all take place like one day after each other yeah it's not even on friday the 13th by the time you get well, to that sure, fourth movie sure. but there's no there's not this big like looming cloud yeah and i thought what if there's more to camp blood mm. than just what happened in the 50s yeah so i thought ralph uh, the Prophet of Doom, or we could call it Camp Blood, the show Camp Blood, or Crystal Lake. I, I had no idea this was happening. Yeah, I don't know where it is, where it stands with the writer's strike and stuff, but it was in production. So my gimmick is Ralph, the actor himself, he's like 70 in the first movie. He was born in 1912. Okay. So Ralph. I thought you were going to say he's still alive. <laughs> oh, fuck no. Um, he, he, he would have been probably in his 30s during the original Camp Blood incident in the 50s. Okay. Right? Um, Where Jason drowns. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, let's, let's reverse expand the lore. Let's go back to the 1930s. Now, have you ever seen a hockey mask from the 1930s? <laughs> I don't think that I have. They're wild. Oh, okay. They look like Hannibal Lecter masks made of leather. Oh. Because, you know, they didn't have plastic. Sure. Plastic wasn't, like, in everything back then. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if it was invented yet. But they, didn't, they, they look like, you know, old football helmets, leather helmets. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. So they're really strange looking. Mm. So I thought, what if we had a 1930s hockey player? Named Jason Voorhees. Okay. We can tie him with the camp, the original Camp Crystal Lake, which was called Camp Blood. Mm. We'll just call it Camp Blood. <laughs> it was named like during the Indian times. Oh, yeah, okay. Who knows? Sure. But uh, Ralph is friends with him and he goes insane. Mm. And he and Pamela Voorhees are lovers. Oh. And he is the original father of Jason. Oh, okay. And somehow he ends up at Camp Crystal Lake and in there uh, this is a series by the way, not well, a movie. Well, of course, yeah. So we have to have uh it's almost like telling the Dar the backstory of Darth Vader, you know, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you how how one fell from grace. Uh, Ralph is 20 something years old, 20 years old, and maybe it's the origin, the start of Camp Crystal Lake or Camp Blood. Okay. They start building the cabins. That's what they're there to do mm -hmm. initially is to build all the cabins. Oh, okay. Um, and teens come to build all the cabins. And um, Jason Voorhees, original Jason Voorhees. Jason Voorhees Sr., I guess. He's a hulking man, and he he gets hired to like um, uh, help build the cabins because he's strong, and he's just like a handyman around town, and he's sort of like the, um, the Boo Radley yeah. In the town where, where um, and then There's maybe stories about him. And yes, Ralph talk becomes about him his, his friend. Oh, wow. and um, and then uh, incidents happen over the season that cause him to become a killer, and he kills with his hockey mask on. Mm. Uh, and uh, eventually, then there's a love triangle with Ralph and Pamela Voorhees and Jason Voorhees. Yeah, and uh, uh, there's an unwanted pregnancy, which is Jason. Could it be like a mystery on which one is the father then? It could be. That could be that could lead to some some tension. The deformity comes during the season finale of season one when Jason Voorhees attempts to end the pregnancy. Oh, oh. and punches her in the stomach. That's what causes the deformity then? Okay, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And which is why she has wants nothing to do with the father. Yeah, yeah. 
But the gimmick is vintage. But when she leaves the father, who's there to, to pick up the slack? It's Crazy Ralph. Crazy Ralph, yes. And yeah. then Jason kind of vanishes. And then season two is when they start a camp. Mm. The camp starts and uh, he just comes back and starts killing. And Ralph and Pamela like want to kind of keep it a secret because they're involved yeah. with the creation of this monster. Um, and they don't want to involve the authorities. I mean, the 1930s, 1940s, the police, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they're not really too involved in the extreme rural camp scenes. Like, well, what's going on in these woods? <laughs> Bunch of teens are disappearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let us know if you hear anything. You know, it's just like, uh, yeah. And so I think that could be a fantastic backstory. Sure. What is Ralph's story? Why is he so crazy? Yeah. Who are you? What do you want? Then once all this dies down after the 50s, he just kind of becomes that town hermit that rambles on about Camp Blood and uh, you're gonna because die. Because he feels, he, he's lost his mind because he feels partially responsible oh, yeah, for he's all gone, this bloodshed. He's gone insane, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's not just Crazy Ralph, he's Crazy Ralph who has a really complicated backstory. Like, Don't go there, <laughs> you're gonna die. <laughs> What's his story? You're all doomed. You're all doomed. Should we eventually, because there's basically... The, Bib Fortuna. <laughs> what's his story? When you get to the third movie, they couldn't bring Crazy Ralph back because he dies in part two. So they have that other guy that dangles the, the eyeball right in the camera lens. Remember that oh guy? Oh my God, yes. I have warned thee. So maybe maybe he also worked on building the cabins. It's just a little Easter egg. Mm, yeah. That other crazy okay. guy. Okay, well, we could pull Easter eggs from all these people. <laughs> Why not? Sure. But we need we need the foundation. Yeah. And um, we could call it Camp Crystal, Camp Crystal Camp Blood, Lake, Camp Blood, or Prophet of Doom. Camp Blood colon Prophet of Doom. Yes. Yeah. There you go. There you you go. got it, Jay. You got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> got to make the title as long and awkward as possible. Oh, like the Dahmer show. We'll call it Jason Dash Camp Blood colon Prophecy. Of Camp Doom. Crystal Lake. Colon, <laughs> double colon, Prophet of Doom. Yes. Yes, a Netflix original series. Look at that. The algorithm will just suck that thing right up. Shoot it out to everybody. I like it. V vintage Jason in old-timey 1930s hockey mask. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's gold. That's gold, and we're giving it away. I guess we're not because they're already making Camp Crystal Lake, so fuck it. I'd watch this show because you could have some good drama there. Some sure, ca sure. character drama. Uh, re uh, relationships, family. It's all about family, really, <laughs> when you boil it down. I will say, maybe you'll find some interest when you get to Jason Goes to Hell, because there's a lot of drama in that, like inter-character drama that is lacking in basically all these other movies. <laughs> so, Well, I would say I'm looking forward to parts 6 through 10, but I'm not. 